Good evening. Good it's good to see everyone out this evening to receive from the Lord's Word and Sacrament. And if you have your announcement sheet, a couple of brief announcements here to pass along to you. Um, as we look now, obviously this is going to be for the following week, for next week. Um, as many of you know, the work weekend for the Shepherd's Hill begins tomorrow. Uh, but the Shepherd's Hill it goes through the weekend. And so then the following week, uh, pretty straightforward with events here at the church. Brief mention, there's a Higher Things Conference leaders meeting next Wednesday. Uh, that'll be next Wednesday following this service. And then also next Friday, not this Friday, but the following Friday on the 7th of June, there'll be Northwest Confession Study here at St. Paul's. Keep that in mind. And then Vacation Bible School is right around the corner as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, the other announcements are in the back of the bulletin. I commend those to you this evening uh, to keep posted here at the church. Is there anything else that I need to mention or may have overlooked at this time? Well, this evening we are setting one, Divine Service setting one. We are the first Sunday, excuse me, the first week in Trinity. Uh, just as a way of reminder, these Wednesday services will be actually kicking off for the following Sunday. So it's Trinity One, celebrate tonight, and Trinity One on Sunday. And then next Wednesday will be Trinity Two, and then the following Sunday will be Trinity Two as well. So keep that in mind. Our opening hymn of invocation is hymn number 798, hymn number 798.
would continue on the top of page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a calm ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro printed on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the tune of C. salvation let us pray to the Lord for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord for this holy house and for all who offer you their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
us pray. Stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people that they, plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may by you be rewarded through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the first week of Trinity, for the first week of Trinity is from Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing our gradual. I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord. Epistle is from the epistle is from first John chapter four. So we have come to know, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in his love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The fear has nothing has the fear has to do with punishment. Excuse me, the fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime that in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them. 
lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear from them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to tell them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 568. Grace, mercy, and peace be and abide with you all through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is taken from 1 John 4, 16 through 21. The words of our epistle lesson for this evening, and we'll be referring to those verses throughout the sermon. St. Paul, uh, St. John, rather, has been called the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was nearest to Jesus at the Passover meal. He asked, Lord, which one of us will betray you? There was rumor among the disciples that maybe he would not die but until the Lord returned once again. But when Peter asked Jesus about this, Jesus had not said that, but Peter said, asked him about it and he said, if I wish that he can live until I come, what is that to you? John did live to be a rather elderly person, somewhere in his 90s, I believe. And he got to see Jerusalem destroyed. He got to see the church well as founded and established. It is reported that, as I said, John was over 90 years old of age when the Lord called him home. He was the only disciple who had a, died a natural death. All the other disciples were martyred. The Emperor Domitian did banish St. John, though, to the island of Patmos, and it was there that he received a revelation from the Lord. The revelation we call the Revelation to St. John, which is the last book of the Bible. After Domitian died, St. John lived in Ephesus, and it's said that he often said, little children love one another. In fact, this exhortation runs like a silver thread through all three of his letters that we are to love one another. Love one another with no, uh, no boundaries as God has first loved us. John is rightly called the apostle of love. Jesus once said, by this you shall know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And it was said of Christians in the early days, see how they love each other. 
On the other hand, if professing Christians quarrel among one another, are mean to one another, cause God's name to be blasphemed by the people in the world around them, and bring Jesus' name to ill repute, those who and the world around them observe this and call them hypocrites have every right to do so. In fact, John wrote, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. True Christian love is the mark which marks the disciples of Jesus, and that's known throughout the whole world. True Christian love is a badge, if you will, which distinguishes the Christian people from all of those in the world around them. True Christian love is the fruit of faith in Jesus Christ. St. Paul wrote, In Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails for anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works love. It is concerning true faith, which St. John speaks of in the words of our text for today, when John tells us that God is love. Yes, God is love. In his first words of our text for today, John tells us, So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. God shows his love by sending his own son, Jesus, to suffer and die on a cross and to rise again to pay for your sins, my sins, the sins of the entire world in full. Yes, we are all sinners who need God's love and need God's forgiveness. God's word tells us no one is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. God's law condemns us all and shows us that no, we cannot save ourselves. God's word tells us now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being is justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Yet, even though we were weak, ungodly sinners, actually God's enemies, God loved us just the same and intervened to our helpless and hopeless situation to save us. God's word tells us, <clears throat> for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have not been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The Bible tells us that what really we deserve is just death, the wages of sin, temporal and eternal death. And yet God gives us eternal life as a free gift through faith in Jesus Christ. God's word tells us for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the words of our text this evening tell us that God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This love we receive through faith in Jesus Christ. The first words of our text tell us, so we have come to know and to believe that God has love for us. Faith has been described as knowledge and assent and confidence. Knowledge means that we hear about the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, so we know about it. And then assent says that we believe it to be true. And finally, we have confidence that through faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and the kingdom of heaven is ours. The story is told about an old farmer who was scared to death to fly. He never wanted to ever fly in his life. But then his favorite granddaughter graduated from high school quite a distance away. And since he was busy in the field planting his crop, he didn't have time to drive that long distance to his granddaughter's graduation, and he certainly didn't want to miss it. And so he flew there. When he got back, somebody asked him about his fear of flying. He said, oh, it wasn't so bad. You know, I never really did put my full weight on the seat. Now, having confidence means that we put our full weight on the seat. We know for certain, we trust completely in God's promise to give us everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. We put our full weight on the seat, if you will. 
This brings us to the next verse where we're told, by this is love perfected with us, so that we have, may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Yes, we may have confidence, even as we face the day of judgment or the day of our own death, the day when our Lord returns, for the Lord will then take all those who have faith in Jesus Christ to himself in heaven. Before Jesus left this world, he told his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you if, if it were not so? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And we need not fear death, for God will be with us to guard us, protect us, and guide us. As King David put it in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes, as we face the day of our, Lord, of our death or the day of our Lord's return, we do so with confidence. We do so with the certainty that God will take us to himself to live with him in the kingdom of heaven, body and soul forever. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, St. Paul tells us, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. St. John tells us that there is no fear in love. He says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. I would suppose that we're all a bit hesitant to even think about our death or about our Lord's return, about the judgment day. We have a certain amount of fear or worry or concern or as the Germans would say, angst about it, about facing the Lord on the last day. This is a fear that is real because we know we're sinners and that those sins need to be paid for, need to be punished. We have a certain amount of guilt as we remember all those past sins that plague us. But we have to remember that Jesus took all the punishment on the cross for us. In his first letter, St. Peter tells us, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that he might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We must remember that all of our sins are forgiven and forgotten because Jesus paid for them in full, and we must forget them then as well. The Bible tells us the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As we feel feelings of guilt, we must remember St. Paul's words to the Romans, for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we remember some of the very first words of St. John's first letter, where he tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that we have been assured of great love, God's great love for us, we're moved to love those around us. Paul tells us we love because he, I'm sorry, John tells us we love because he first loved us. We hear people saying something like, well, I remember the exact day and the exact hour and minute that I found Jesus. Well, I didn't even know Jesus was lost. Or someone might say something to the effect that I have decided to follow Jesus implying that they were the ones who were active. They were the ones who took the initiative to begin a relationship with Jesus as their Lord and Savior. No, nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus tells us in the Gospel of St. John, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so you'll love 
one another. Dr. Martin Luther, in his explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed, says, and you probably can quote this with me as you learned it in confirmation class, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. St. John says further in the words of our text for today, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he, does not love it, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Jesus commands us to love one another as he has first loved us with a tremendous self-sacrificing love. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I've heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus even tells us, believe it or not, that we're to love our enemies. Remember on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus, con <coughs> I'm sorry, Jesus concludes the words of our, our text by saying, And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. In the words of our text for today, we learn that we are to love one another as Christ has first loved us. This may mean that we love, uh, that love will seek to bring back a brother or a sister who's strayed from the truth. James tells us, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Dr. Martin Luther, in his sermon on Epiphany, said, and I quote, Scripture teaches us to adopt the following attitude toward the sins of our neighbor. First, we should not be filled with mistrust, but whenever possible, put the best construction on everything we see in the life of our neighbor, provided it is not public sin. For this, St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, Love does not think the worst. This is, it assumes, the best in everyone and bears no ill toward anyone, believes that others think and act in the same way as love itself thinks and acts. Even when love acts in a way that appears to be evil, it has good intentions and so puts the best inter interpretation on the deeds of everyone else, however evil they may seem to be. Second, where the deed of the neighbor is obviously evil, so that in a good interpretation is not possible, love acts as follows. If the deed is done in secret and love alone sees it or hears about it, it will keep silence, keep it buried within itself, say nothing about it to anyone, and wherever possible, cover it up so that no one hears about it. In this way, love preserves the honor of the neighbor. Love will quietly take him aside, tell him his fault, pray for him, have patience and mercy, and think as one of the ancient fathers thought who said, this man fell yesterday, today I might fall. Or if he sins in this matter, I sin in others. Both of us are in need of the same grace. So love forgives and helps, even as it prays that it too may be forgiven and helped. End of quote. And as the late Dr. Oswald C.J. Hoffman often said, what more can I add than that? Then amen, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes our frail human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in faith in Jesus Christ until life everlasting. Amen.
With one heart and one voice, let us stand and confess the faith as expressed in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that like Abraham, we may believe your promises to us in Christ, and it may be counted to us for righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give to your servants all that is needed for this body and life. Heal and strengthen and comfort the sick, the suffering, the sorrowing, and the dying, and to hear the prayers of all who call upon your saving name. We pray especially this evening for Arlene and Aspen, Brian, Kari, Carl, Charlotte, Deb, Fern, Gail, Gordy, Jeff, Jim, Joellen, Josh, Callie, Kim, Marvin, Megan, Marilyn, Mark, Miles, Pastor Jinx, Philip, Randy, Roger, Ruth, Shirley, and Travis. Teach us to pray so that our hearts may not be undone by anxiety and fear, but rejoice in your grace that is sufficient for our every need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, you have kept your promise to Abraham and brought forth the offspring in whom all nations are blessed and counted righteous, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to all people saving faith in this promised Savior and work in them the love that flows from your love alone. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be saved for the offering music. Please stand for the offertory on 781. The service of the sacrament on 160.
is truly good, right, and salutary, that we should at all times, at all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... in your kingdom and teach us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This you in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
we stand as we thank the Lord. source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Congregation may be safe for departing him. Hymn number 851.